everyone. Uh, to start with a funny story, my, the title of my presentation, The Day That's Eating Everything. So I'm a technology guy, and I sent this presentation to Proofree to one of my friends. We went to, to university together, and then they told us that, well, you're in a good place because software is eating the world. So now we are in data analytics, and they, say, they, they tell us that data is eating everything. So this is a really good run so far. And when he, he told me that maybe five years from now I will be here standing, but with a different word, like what's eat the word at that time, and he said it's probably Chinese economy, but let's, let's hope we keep up the good run. So the data that's eating everything, and what I want to do is to go through a few use cases, how companies can use data as kind of a preparation for, for today, and also how you can start with it. So what are the requirements to do a successful project, and a few, a few uh, predictions about the future I, I hope my predictions come true, so it's kind of a competition between predictions. So what data are we talking about? And one of the messages here is that you think that you don't have these data, but what I see with companies is that every company has the data that they need usually. Even, maybe just to start a project, but they all have the data they need. So a few examples, and these are the examples where I participated, so I helped companies to, to mature and, and, and create their data analytical capabilities. So one idea from sales and financial reporting when you have those data is to do inventory forecast. One prime example is Walmart. When, when Hurricane Katrina hit, Walmart had a real-time analytical in pl analytics in place to see what, what's selling, so what kind of items. And as you can imagine, water, toilet paper, they were in a prime, a top five items. But one other item which sold pretty well was strawberry Pop-Tarts, for some reason. They, they had no idea why, but they were selling like crazy. So what they did in real time, they retargeted uh, supplies to the Walmart shops around the disaster area, and they sold a lot of strawberry, uh, uh, strawberry Pop-Tarts. So doing inventory forecasts is, is one way to use, use data. Also A-B testing, and I always come up with A-B testing because A-B testing is basically if you have a hypothesis about uh, what, like if you change the color background of your sales materials, maybe conversion will be better. It's usually associated with digital products. So usually like Prezi does it, but they have a digital project, product. But A-B testing can be done with physical goods. So if you have a factory, you can still do A-B testing with things like sales materials or how you price your, your items. A-B testing is, uh, is, is really interesting in, in all areas, not just digital products. New services in markets. We had this client, a Finnish company, building huge um, machines uh, for marinol use. And uh, they use analytics to create new products. So they, they look at the, the financial and, and sales data and they say, what, can, what, uh, what other services can we offer to our clients? And they came up with a new support model, how they basically they, they give these machines on a subscription fee, which was totally unheard of, solely based on the data that they have on sales. Uh, industry 4.0, it's a big hit. So what are we talking about with Industry 4.0? And these are easy examples. So when you, see, when you think about Industry 4.0, everyone thinks about robots and artificial intelligence, but the first step is usually way, way easier. So one big area is yield maximization, where you have a factory and you have sensors. An important thing is that you don't need new stuff for that. So old machinery, old production lines, can we equip with sensors? to enable uh, these analytics. So yield maximization where you compare humidity, temperature, air pressure, vibration of the machines and electricity consumptions and correlate that with how much output the factory has to get the maximum output you can, you can, you can get. And also uh, you can do this across factories. So usually factories optimize their output on their local data, but most companies have a lot of factories usually on different continents. So what it enables us to do is to correlate data from different factories so you can see that this product line works pretty well in Europe, but for some reason in Asia, the yield is just not that high. How can, how, what's the reason? So what are the bottlenecks? Productive maintenance, one of, one of the biggest hit in Industry 4.0 now is to increase the lifetime of, of uh, equipment. So how you can do that? With a single 
electricity sensor, you can see if a machine takes more electricity to run than others, which is a prime sign of degradation in some parts. And what, what, what factories can do is to replace the part before it broke. So actually you get a better lifetime for, for, the, for the equipment, but also you can get, uh, you get, get home without any downtime. Another, another example for this is Fanuc, which is a supplier for General Motors, and they had a problem with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uptime. So they had a lot of downtime because of broken machines. And they equipped their machines with sensors, and they achieved zero, uh, time, zero downtime for a whole year, and they, award, they had this, uh, I think the name was uh, uh, Best Supplier Innovation of the Year Award from General Motors, because they went uh, from having a problem with uptime to be the best supplier with uptime because of the data that they had about their machines and they have the analytics to find the root causes and fixing the root causes and now they, they are analyzing that data real time so they know why machines are broken down and they basically just project that into the future and they can see if a machine will broke down in the next one month. Quality control. So you think that the, the, one of the big thing in Chinese manufacturing is the low, low labor cost, but uh, Shenzhen is a city in, in China, they're investing billions of dollars each month to automate and to support their factories with artificial intelligence. So with uh, quality control, usually, usually uh, in a lot of manufacturing uh, plants, people are looking at things and say it's broken or it's not. So it's basically a visual inspection. But a machine can do it way faster, with more precision, to, uh, without any uh, pause. And it has better, uh, better results than humans. And they're investing a lot in that, because also the uh, price of workforce goes up in China too. So they are replacing their low-cost labor force with artificial intelligence and machines, and data powers that. So quality control is a uh, great example. Logistics and warehouses. Just-in-time inventory is one of, my, one of my favorites because we went from huge warehouses to this whole lean methodology where we don't want to stock a lot of stuff in our warehouses. We, start, we, we try to create a production line where we can just store what we really need. But the next step is, it's also a Finnish company, they basically connected their website with their factory. It's the same idea what Adidas does. Adidas did with their speed factory. When a client orders something, it goes through right to the factory and the factory produces it. So it's not just that they don't have too many warehouses now, they basically don't even have that because they only manufacture what, what is actually ordered. Of course, it doesn't work everywhere, but it helps with reducing the things you have to store and you have to produce. Amazon could, cu could uh, cut 20% of their uh, warehouse cost by analyzing how people moved around the warehouses and they changed the layout to, be, to, to help their workers to be more productive. And another, st another step, they replace workers with robots. So now robots bring the stuff to workers and workers just giving out uh, the, 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 the products to the delivery company and they are delivering these things to, uh, to your door. And the, in the first step, just by analyzing how their workers moved around the warehouse and changing the layout, they, could, they, they cut 20% from their cost. And now they are replacing the delivery company with drones. Uh, another example from our history is uh, a logistics company. Most of their expense was fuel. So basically, all, most of the revenue went to fuel. And by analyzing fuel consumptions, you could see where the company loses fuel. So where drivers don't drive in this green zone when the fuel consumption is optimal. And based on that data, they, they created an application that helps and motivates the drivers to keep the truck in the green zone and reducing the fuel consumption by 5%, which is in a company where like, I think 90% of their expense is fuel, it's a huge optimization. Supply chain, securing the supply chain. So many, many uh, companies have problems with their supply chain. This is a good example because it's, how, it's a good example how, people, how companies can use external data. So when you have a supply chain, you can get data from, from your suppliers. 
ask them to open up their data so you can, you can see what they are doing in almost real time. It helps, it helps to secure your supply chain, but also to have quality control. So analyzing data, you can see that some suppliers have problems delivering quality uh, during the summer, but not during the winter time. So you can, you can secure your supply line by, by having more suppliers in the winter time or help with negotiations or just support them to tell them that, hey, this is the data it tells us. It tells us that you're always late in the winter time, so let's figure it out how we can have that. So that's about securing the supply chain. So how can I be successful in this? And this is, this is the time of free consultancy, which I tell you what I see, what are the problems with, with these data projects. One thing is that companies where they start, they don't have baby steps. And I always promote baby steps because when a company gets into this data-driven mindset, they want the death star. So you start with, start with Excel sheets, and in one month, they want to build this huge project. And that's, that's, that's a, very good, uh, a very good way to fail with the product. So first, first start with something small, uh, a pilot project. And when a company has data, they, they tend to think, what, I can, what, I can, what can I do with this data? But the right approach is to start with the business problem, because we have this data economy where everything is centered around data. But one thing didn't change is that we still have to solve business problems and not technology problems. So always start with the business problem and find the data that can help with that. And if you don't have that data, start another, do something else where you have the data. So always use your existing data when you, start, uh, when you start a new project because it helps to minimize the risks. The biggest problem with innovation and what I see, and this is my personal project for 2018 and 19, is to facilitate communication between tech and business. Because think about the examples that I gave you. Those are not really innovative ideas. Like, we all have heard about those things. The reason is because I'm, a I'm on the technology side, so we help companies to build up their data analytical capabilities, but use cases are on the business side. So I cannot come up with business problems, or I can come up with business problems, but that's not a good idea. So I have to talk to the business side, what are your problems, what are your pain points, what are you struggling with, and maybe I have a solution. But if we don't communicate, business side don't know what's doable. And let me tell you, in data analytics, it's not AI, it's not machine learning, but in just data processing, almost anything is possible. Now, the technology is there, the skill set, the professionals are there. We have to find the good use cases. And the, re and the way to do that is to help uh, facilitate communication between the technology side, which has the tools, and the business side, which has the use cases and the means. So going into productions, uh, I'm going to skip this. Um, why, what, what, why data is so important? Because it, if it's either the very center of innovation or it's a very uh, significant part of it, but in the future, most of the innovations will be based on data. Most companies, even if they are not data companies, they're going to turn in some degree a data company. Companies like GE, they are turning to a uh, data company. Companies like Tesla, as, as, as was mentioned, it's a data company. So almost all of the companies in the future will be in some part a data company. AI is powered by data, and we're all living up a revolution of artificial intelligence. Andrew Ng is one of the main figures of artificial intelligence. They said AI is the new electricity, which is a synonym of data is the new gold. And here's what we have now on technological progress. We are on an expansion, in an uh, exponential growth, and this is how an exponential curve looks like. So this is, this is where we are standing, and you, mu you might ask that, why are we not freaking out? And the reason why we're not freaking out is because, because this is a timeline. So everything to your, to your left is the past, everything to your right is the future. So we're not freaking out because this is what you see. This is, this is the past. But you cannot project the past progress to the future. Think about how much the world evolved from the 80s to the 90s and then how much it evolved for the last 10 years. And it's staggering how fast the change is. So that's the catch in, the in an exponential curve that you cannot project your past progress because everything is just faster and faster and faster. So you can decide whether you want to be, uh, you want to be part of this change. You can decide whether you want to buy your, buy your company into this data economy or the AI revolution that might come. 
one thing you cannot decide, one that you cannot uh, uh, choose, is the change that's happening. So this is happening. China is spending a crazy amount of money on AI. All of the companies are turning into data companies. So it's not the question of, is it happening? It is happening. The question is, where you want to be in that change? So thank you very much. And if you have, if you have any use cases, please talk to me. Because as I mentioned, I cannot come up with the use cases. I can only come up with the technology that might solve your problem. So one of the big things that we can do is to communicate, to help find us new use cases and where we can create value. Thank you very much.